Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Matt from GL Communications. I uh, will start with uh, a couple introductions, and um, while people are joining, we'll, we'll get going here. So I'd like to welcome everyone. This is um, another webinar that GL puts out. We try to do this on a monthly basis. So this is a continued webinar series that we have. And if you've been with us before, uh, thank you for returning. If you're new, uh, welcome. Uh, we hope that you enjoy it. Uh, we try to put this webinar on so that we um, can discuss a, a subject in the uh, telecommunications field or it's a way for us to uh, also just discuss our products a little bit and just kind of go over them in, in somewhat of an overview uh, manner. So um, we're gonna do that today and with Today's webinar, uh, the title of it is Advanced Test Platforms for TDM Networks. So if you're familiar with GL Communications in the past, you know that uh, for many years we've had uh, telecommunications or TDM type test equipment. And um, we're gonna go over some of those uh, legacy networks, some of the legacy products that GL has, some of the advancements uh, with those products that we've been um, putting together, and some of the software features, some of the, um, just the applications that we can run on top of the hardware that we have. So uh, for introductions, my name is Matt, and I will be joined uh, occasionally by VJ, uh, colleagues of mine, VJ and Sanjeev. Uh, Sanjeev hi. is going to, yes, hi VJ. <laughs> uh, Sanjeev is going to help uh, watching our, um, questions that you may have. So if you do have a question throughout the uh, webinar, I encourage you to uh, type that question into the little chat window there on the GoToWebinar sort of uh, screen that you have, the little toolbar to the right. And Sanjeev will be monitoring those and will um, present those to us at the end. And uh, you know, you can, we can have an exchange on, on question and answer at the end of this. Um, until then, we're just probably going to be presenting. Um, but you you will have an opportunity, like I say at the end, to ask some questions. We can even unmute your microphone if you'd like, and you can talk to us, and we can just discuss a few things. So uh, with all that said, thank you um, for, for joining again. I, one, one other note before we get started. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. And like all of our other past webinars are available, it will be available shortly on our website. So you can always join, uh, go to the website at gl.com, bring up the webinar, review it, uh, go to past webinars and so forth. So with that said, let me uh, get started here um, with a brief company overview of GL Communications. Uh, we're headquartered in Gaithersburg, Maryland in the United States. Uh, we have multiple uh, branch offices uh, and, and a lot of worldwide representatives. Uh, our branch offices are, one, one is located in Eng uh, India, in Bangalore, India, and we have another in Shanghai, China. And we've got representatives throughout the world in a lot of countries. Um, and we were established in 1986, so we've been around for a while. And basically, we are two divisions of our company. Um, the one that we're going to be talking about today is the Test and Measurement Equipment Division. So we provide telecommunications testing equipment, testing uh, solutions, both hardware and software. And they span uh, PDM, IP, wireless networks, and so forth. The basic theme with a lot of our test equipment, 95% of our test equipment, is that it is uh, PC-based and Windows-based, so we're Windows Shop, and we have easy, easy to use GUIs, um, so that you can be using um, our software, our test solutions in the lab, in the field, wherever, on a laptop. Um, we have a lot of remote access capabilities for automation and so forth that can be used as well, but and we'll talk about those briefly. The other division to the company as you can see, is engineering consulting services. We, we've maintained um, a lot of engineering consulting services for uh, a lot of local, uh, state, federal, uh, local governments here and around the Maryland, D.C. area. So we 
do a lot of work for them as well. The webinar agenda today uh, kind of broken up into really three different categories. We're going to talk about our TDM hardware boards and units. So we're going to discuss T1, E1, T3, E3, OC312, higher speed things. Uh, how those boards, those are sort of the raw boards and units that GL has developed, the hardware. How those boards fit into different platforms um, that will host them uh, will be talked about briefly. And uh, these boards can be in a portable or a luggable platform. You can take them out into the field. Um, or they can be uh, in, in your lab uh, um, in, in a rack mount server based sort of platform. We also have, and we'll, we'll talk about briefly here, a, a new uh, platform that GL is, is introducing called the MTOP unit. And I'll get into what that means, but it's basically, uh, in short, we're able to uh, put multiple boards in custom configurations um, into one unit, one sort of universal unit for, for things, and I'll, and I'll show you that. After we talk about all the hardware and the platforms, we're going to highlight some of our featured software applications. And um, we won't be talking about, GL has a whole array of, of software applications that run on, the, on these hardwares. We're going to pick and choose a few of them and talk about them in this webinar. Um, they're going to be in, um, talked about in two basic categories, and that is intrusive options, intrusive software applications, so protocol emulators, BERT testers, quality of service um, metrics, and so forth, as well as non-intrusive options. So our protocol analysis software that spans many protocols, our voice and signal uh, quality of service in a non-intrusive manner. So we'll talk about those two things, and then we'll get into a little bit of our remote access capabilities. So as we get started here, I want to start with, um, as, as with the agenda here, the TDM hardware boards and units. I'll give you a brief overview of what GL has in that arena. With T1E1, um, GL has a couple products, a couple products that um, sort of are organized in two two manners. One of them is a portable version. Uh, we call it a portable version, and it's a USB 2.0 device. So this is called our key probe unit, and as you can see visually here, there are two T1 interfaces or E1 interfaces available on this unit. It is, it is again, a USB 2.0 device, so it needs a host computer. Uh, that can be a laptop, that can be a desktop, that can be a server. Um, it just needs a host computer with a USB port on it. Capabilities of this device are uh, similar to, and I'll we'll talk about them, all of our other T1E1 devices that we're going to show you here, they all basically have the same capabilities. All software, all software that GL offers and has available will be available for this device. So there's no, you know, in this portable, um, you know, form factor here, there's no limitation on what software can be run. Okay, so again, two T1 or E1 devices uh, interfaces. On this on this T probe unit, we also have a VF in and out uh, VF drops, so you can actually uh, drop the VF from different channels and time slots of the T1s and E1s and listen to them. It's an optional board that can be put on this unit, and it's being shown here. Uh, we call it the Datacom board and FXO FXS board. So um, this device as well can uh, emulate a phone or a um, sort of a CO uh, two-wire line in FXS side of, of, of the network, provides battery and so forth, as well as a lot of data comm interfaces that we have here. We'll talk about those in brief. So this is sort of our platform uh, in the T1E1 world um, for what we're kind of calling a portable or somewhat flexible um, piece of hardware that can be, uh, again, USB-based, can be plugged into any PC that you may have. Some of the features that uh, I'd like to mention here, the product can do uh, 
it can be set up in different modes when you're talking about T1-E1 testing. It can be in a terminate mode, so an endpoint on a T1 or E1 line. We can be bridging onto that, uh, that, that circuit or that T1-E1 line in a non-intrusive manner, or we could be monitoring, connected to a monitor port. Maybe you have a DSX patch panel and we can connect there. So we, the different levels, um, um, we can connect at the, at the appropriate level there. A um, lot of lot of features and functions with the standard software with these guys uh, with this product. Uh, we'll talk about those in brief. Um, but we also the way that we've set up our products is that we you purchase the, this piece of hardware, you get a basic set of T1 and E1 functionality. Um, sorry, my microphone's a little off here. Uh, basic basic software applications that you can use with it. And that includes a lot of things, okay? That's including a BERT tester in an intrusive manner. That includes a lot of monitoring capabilities. You can monitor all the signaling bits, the levels, the, the frequencies, all of that, oscilloscopes, spectrum analyzers, all of the nice things that if you're familiar with GL, you get with the basic software. Then we have some advanced software uh, we call those optional applications. All of our hardware is set up in this manner where you can add software licenses to the to the product, to the hardware. Those include things, a good example for that would be a protocol analysis. So for instance, this, this T-probe has the ability to do protocol analysis on a wide variety of protocols that may, you may find on a T1 or E1 line. Those include ISDN PRI, SS7, CAS protocols, all of the variants. So if you're a customer and you're interested only in ISDN PRI, you can buy just the ISDN PRI optional software. And, and, you know, and you can pick and choose from that. And we have a laundry list of optional softwares that this, this product can support. So that's so the basic idea of how we set up our, our, our um, purchasing and our hardware. The next product, very similar to what I just showed you in the T -pro, with the T-Probe, but this is a uh, PCI Express-based board. So this board can be installed into a, a rack computer, a, a PC board, um, and that can be installed into some standard computer. So not as portable. Uh, you do need a host computer for it as well, but um, it's a nice it's a nice card that can be used. Again, it's a dual port T1 E1 uh, two ports there you can see. Um, that can be installed in a, in a server computer. You can stack these up. You can have many of these cards in a server computer. This is the latest uh, piece of hardware that we have. Um, there's some new features that are better on this, make it a little faster than our previous generation boards. And all software applications that I've mentioned so far and that we're going to talk about are available on this product as well. Even higher density, we GL has a quad slash octal T1E1 board. So in this case, you can see we're increasing the number, of course, and the main board on this uh, uh, octal card has four T1E1 interfaces. There is a daughter card that can come with it, and you can add four more. So you'll get eight uh, T1E1 interfaces with this particular card. Again, all functionality, all software, everything is the same with that T-Probe, that dual express card, and now this octal card. Even higher capacity, GL has something we call the T-Scan 16 board. Now, the difference between this one and the other ones I've mentioned is this is a 16-port RX-only T1E1 interface. So uh, some of the intrusive testing applications that I was mentioning before, like um, intrusively doing bit error rate testing or intrusively trying to emulate a protocol are not available with this, this product. This is an RX-only, so this is a monitor mode product uh, only. So you can be monitoring up to 16 um, 
T1s or E1 interfaces. Okay, so RX only, very high density. You can stack multiple of these cards into a single server host PC, so you can expand on the number that you would need. So concentrated uh, location where you're needing monitor only, receive only, this is a very good product for that. Okay, now we're getting a little bit higher, higher rate. Um, we're talking about T3 and E3. Uh, we have a T3, E3 analyzer. Uh, very similar in nature to the T probe that I showed you earlier, where this product is uh, a USB based product and um, uh, in, a, in a small portable form factor, as you can see. It has two ports for T3 E3 uh, testing. It can be intrus intrusive and non intrusive. So, um, you can be monitoring a, a T3 network, an E3 network, or you can be an endpoint in terminate mode and actually testing down the line. So it's channelized, unchannelized, a lot of different um, software uh, setup features that we have with this product. Um, you have also the ability to drop an ins or insert a T1 out of the T3 and maybe look at it in a lot more detail or something like that. So it can be married with one of our previous slides there, one of our, our, our T1, E1 products, and you get a full comprehension, uh, comprehensive test from T3 to T1 to DS0. So another hardware platform that GL has, this T3 analyzer unit. Again, USB based. Matt, I want yes. to just one thing here. Sure. When we go to these higher platforms like T3, E3, and then of course you'll be talking about OC3, uh, and OC12, uh, we can analyze all of the channels through software only. Although physically we can drop uh, one or two T1s on these, physically, electrically, but in software we can analyze all of the, uh, I guess, 600 or so channels that would be in a T3, 28 T1s times 24 time slots. Time slot. for um, 16 E1s uh, times uh, 31 time slots, okay? Okay, yeah, very good. Okay, let me move on here with one other. Okay, so I can, we're kind of showing that a little here um, with a channelized T3, E3 analyzer slide that we have where we, we're showing um, the uh, 28 duplex T1s uh, of the T3 and we're basically monitoring that, running it down to our software there. It's just a, an illustration of how that's being done with this T3 analyzer. So um, as VJ mentioned, in software, we're able to monitor all of the T1s, all of the DSC rows of that T3. So uh, VJ, would you mind explaining a little bit about the OC312 card for us? Uh, just sure. Uh, Okay, so as we go up the TDM hierarchy, um, you know, we moved from T3, E3, which was even, uh, you know, it was older, it was called the plesiochronous architecture, meaning the timing was allowed to vary uh, between the T1s and the E1s. Uh, when you move to Sonnet and SDH, they went to a synchronous network, a fully synchronous network. And there they started calling these things OC3s and OC12s because they were writing on fiber. T3, E3 used to be writing on coaxial cable, essentially, or uh, either digital microwave radio. Um, so those were the predominant methods. But when they introduced, you know, when fiber optics took off, uh, they introduced a completely new synchronous hierarchy called Sonnet in America, in Europe, it's called SDH. And there we had even higher densities, and you are aware of, generally you probably are aware of that. Here we're talking about 63 E1s, for example, or 84 T1s in an OC3. Uh, and in uh, OC12, it's four times that. So you're talking about literally um, thousands of channels. In an OC12, they would be, what, close to 8,000 voice channels. So we're we just jumped another magnitude in higher uh, in uh, density, so we have a platform for that. 
uh, we're also introducing a platform for STM uh, 16 and uh, OC uh, 48, for example, and, and higher up. Okay. And uh, we, we do exactly the same thing. We're doing, as we started from the very beginning, uh, Matt introduced you the, to the T-probe, where we were analyzing individual T1s and E1s and the DS0s, and we were we were emulating or analyzing protocols on those DS0s or on the T1s and E1s. Well, here we're talking about thousands, and we're still able to do exactly the same thing, even though the multiplier is a thousand. That's in a nutshell. <clears throat> this is the um, these are the products that we uh, that we have for these fiber interfaces. The uh, okay. Yeah, okay. thank you. Yeah, thank you, Vijay. And I think the next slide sort of illustrates it a little bit more here on how we would use this Lightspeed 1000 um, hardware board to uh, monitor. And this is showing a, a non-intrusive monitoring. So we have a fiber tap that is, um, you know, sending this this monitored traffic on the network down to our card, and then we're able to analyze and capture, emulate these, uh, you know, two times 80, well, depending on what you're using there, uh, the, the capacity that VJ was mentioning of all the DS0s down to the DS0 level. So traditional solution there we're showing is maybe needing a MUX and then breaking that out, then running it into uh, many T1E1 analyzer cards that you would have. So you can see that you're saving a lot because we're able to actually monitor, analyze uh, with this one card all the way down down the hierarchy. So, okay, uh, moving on a little bit, that sort of gives you a basis for a foundational basis of uh, our TDM hardware boards uh, and units, our hardware. Um, as, as VJ was mentioning, we're coming out with some even higher speed things uh, very soon. But all of these uh, boards, all of all of these uh, raw boards and units that we have, can, as I mentioned, need to be hosted by a some computing platform. So, these the title of this webinar is Advanced Platforms. I just wanted to mention a few of these uh, platforms to host these boards and units. So that is what the next couple slides are devoted to, and the first. Uh, first slide is about portable and luggable platforms. So GL has a variety of things that you can you can use with us. Um, all of our boards that we mentioned there, PCI Express boards and so forth, can be inserted into uh, different platforms, different computing platforms. The one on the bottom right here, we kind of refer to that as our lunchbox unit. So it's a it's a luggable uh, platform. It's a luggable uh, computing. Uh, platform here running Windows OS and we can insert our cards into this um, into this device multiple cards is capable of, of housing multiple cards the one in the middle top uh, we refer to that internally as the briefcase it's a little narrower it's a little thinner um, again luggable you can carry it um, into the field and it can house multiple I think up to two or three uh, PCI Express cards so you can put one of our T1E1 cards in there, or OC312 card in there, and you have a very comprehensive solution for uh, testing and sort of luggability running into the field. What I, what I mentioned earlier about our products that are USB 2.0 based, USB 3.0 based now with some of our higher speed things, uh, they need a, a, a USB port. So that lends itself to using a laptop PC or a tablet PC, something like that. Some, so um, all of those uh, Matt, that software. Yes. Yeah, speak up, man. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. The software on uh, the software can be run on these laptops or tablets, and uh, you can just connect them to the USB port on 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 that computing platform. Just briefly, that's where we, uh, I wanted to show you some of the platforms that we had there. Um, some of the rack mount platforms that people use uh, our cards in. Um, 
for you rack mount PCs, server grade PCs. We can stack in, in multiple cards in that. We're showing a couple octo cards right now in the back of this server. Um, those can be that T-Scan 16 card for, for higher density on the T1E1 side, octo card, the dual card, whatever your need is on the interface count, we can put them into these uh, rack mount servers. Okay. Now, one thing we would like to mention and introduce, if you're not familiar with it yet, but it's it's been uh, fairly recently introduced from GL, is a platform that we're calling the MTOP, okay? And basically that is a, a very modular design that we've come up with where uh, if you can see, we have basically three bays, we'll call it, in a 1U rack mount platform. So three bays can house uh, any three of our USB products. So a T-probe can go in there, uh, a Datacom uh, T-probe can go in there. A, um, a T3, E3 unit can go in there, and we can mix and match, and you can put whatever you want in any one of the bays. You have liberty to put what you want in each bay. So we have three bays. Um, you can mix and match your, your, your numbers of T probes, your T3 units, even some of, if you're interested in IP, we, we have Ethernet testers that can be put into this. So all of our products that are USB-based can easily be put in here in a sort of, we call it a customizable manner, but it's very flexible. It's a very flexible art. Matt, yep. what, what, what we mean there is <clears throat> M stands for multiple, T stands for TDM, O stands for optical, P stands for packet. So okay. GL produces uh, you know, uh, plat uh, technology uh, instruments across all technologies, and we're able to uh, accommodate both TDM, optical, and packet products in one uh, one of these MTOP units. So uh, a customer that has uh, both legacy and next generation technologies can mix and match our boards into one platform and be able to uh, address all these requirements. Yeah, so it makes it very flexible for, for the customers. Um, and uh, one other thing to mention about this is it also includes the computing platform. So we're keeping up with uh, the computing platform here. So the computer, the Windows OS, all of that is housed in this unit as well. So um, it's one unit, very flexible for TDM, optical packet-based products that GL offers can be placed in here with the computing platform, Windows OS, all of that. So uh, it's very flexible in that sense. Um, we're excited about it, Our, we're getting getting a lot of good reviews from it uh, as of right now. It provides the customer a lot of options for, for putting our products together. So it's a good platform for us and it's gonna be the one that we use going forward. Okay. So back to the agenda, um, we've talked about the hardware boards and units. We've talked about some of the platforms, the portability of them, the rack mount units. Now we're going to get into some of the featured software applications. Before I get into that, um, you know, for this webinar, we've just picked a few of them. GL has a, a wide variety of, of these uh, software applications that can run on all of these boards and hardwares that we've talked about. So we just picked a few of the highlights. Uh, we've organized them into two real categories here, and those are intrusive options, so intrusive testing and non-intrusive testing. So with the intrusive testing, we're gonna start out with some of our protocol emulators, the BERT, and some voice quality of service um, applications. So I'll get into those, and then we'll, we'll, we'll transition into non-intrusive options. Okay. So with this, um, I may ask VJ to help a little bit with the BERT testing and the record playback, but these are very traditional sort of baseline applications that we offer with all of our uh, boards and uh, hardware that we've already presented to you. And BERT is a very fundamental test that needs to be done. So VJ, would you mind explaining sure. like some of this? Uh, okay, so uh, as you all might know, uh, bit error rate measurement is a fundamental data communications 
um, measurement uh, that is used that was used uh, early on when you were testing modems. Uh, it's used when you're testing T1E1 lines, DS0s, the entire T1E1, uh, the full T3E3 or individual channels. Uh, whenever you're trying to establish connectivity between two endpoints, whatever the capacity it is, even in the packet domain, we use bit error rate testing to, to establish continuity, error-free um, uh, transmission. So BERT is a very fundamental, and uh, for BERT, generally the traffic is called pseudo-random bit sequences. And these are traditional sequences that are repetitive, but have a very long period, uh, depending on which, which pattern you use. So the, uh, we handle BERT at the DS0 level, that means at the 64 kilobit, or even at the sub-channel, um, uh, a small portion of the 64 kilobits, or the entire T1E1, or some fractional number of time slots, we call that a hyper-channel or a fractional channel, uh, bit error rate. And we, we follow that up by doing being able to do that multiple times uh, simultaneously on hyper channels or DS zeros. And we work our way up all the way up to OC3, OC12, for example, uh, as we showed you our platforms. So fundamentally, uh, bit error rate can be done on all of the channels, DS zeros, all the way up to the concatenated big pipe. So you could theoretically test the uh, OC3 or OC12 pipe in one blast. So we call that uh, concatenated bit error rate testing. Or you could subdivide that into channels. Those could be T1E1 channels or T3E3 channels or DS0s. So obviously uh, our BERT can, can uh, span the gamut of the channel capacity. And we have that, we have this, what we call um, we can generate these pseudo-random patterns either through files or in real time, uh, where we're generating them in, in the CPU. Um, and we can do that in, uh, in parallel on so many channels that we've been talking about. Um, so that's, uh, that spans across our entire platform. So that's a very fundamental measurement uh, that is used across uh, TDM technologies, packet, optical, what have you? So that is uh, that uh, comes with the territory. Essentially, you have to have that. And we 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 provide that capability, not only in against I guess uh, I think what we we uh, distinguish ourselves in being able to do that on thousands of parallel channels simultaneously, so that we can do that. Um, okay. And, and the record playback application that we're showing here in the top, le uh, top left, the automated record playback, um, kind of explain a little bit about, would you go ahead and explain sort of um, okay. what capabilities so there, that has? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There we can actually customize um, the record and playback of uh, bit error rate patterns. Here we're showing that we're just running these data patterns. These could be different data patterns on different um, ports of a T1E1. These could be separate T1E1s that, that transmit, receive. One is recording while another is transmitting. Uh, there might be occasion where you might want to not just do real-time measurement, but you may also want to record the patterns uh, for uh, later offline analysis. So this gives you a lot of flexibility in arranging the bit error rate uh, transmission and reception uh, to customize for your particular application is certainly. It also, it's, it's also um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but this it's applicable to bit error rate testing, but you can also send and That's record right. voice files and so forth like that for quality of service testing. Right. So That's right. Yeah, you're right. Uh, so it doesn't have to be necessarily a bit error rate patterns. It could be a voice files. It could be um, many voice files. So this is uh, shows you only about nine different tasks that are running, but this could be hundreds of tasks that are running. Uh, they could be voice, different voice files, and so on. That's okay, so, Yeah, so fundamentally, um, this type of application for recording and playback can be used for what we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation for 
quality of service monitoring for voice quality, voice in particular quality monitoring. So this application can send and record voice files, multiple time slots and so forth. And the recorded voice files can be used for a voice quality testing and be spit, uh, run into an algorithm and give you a quality score that we'll show you. Okay. So moving on, um, again, in the intrusive testing mode here, we're actually uh, talking about a platform that GL offers across all types of uh, interfaces, uh, modes, uh, TDM, IP, and wireless protocols, and so forth. This, this platform we refer to as MAPS. Okay, MAPS stands for Message Automation and Protocol Simulation. Um, it's sort of our, our generic platform for generating all types of protocols. Um, and we're talking about, as you can see here in the TDM world, we're talking about legacy CAS protocols, ISDN, PRI, and so forth, SS7, and, and so forth, on up. This, this is a platform that's um, used you know, throughout GL, for all types of IP protocols. So you're probably familiar even if, if TDM is your Matt, main let game. Me, yes. uh, yep. uh, let me go through one train and then you can go through the other train. Uh, okay. and see if you can adjust your mic as well. Um, uh, you're, sometimes you're coming in a little low volume. So that in the TDM, okay, MAPS, as, Ma, as Matt just mentioned, is Message Automation Protocol Simulation. This is our platform for uh, protocols. As you know, uh, protocols are necessary for placing voice calls or data calls or SS7 sessions or signaling or establishing tones. Uh, some, some of the signaling is done by tones. So uh, our MAPS product is our intrusive protocol emulator for practically all protocols that exist in either TDM, packet, uh, wireless, um, or even channel associated analog circuits. So it's a very versatile platform. Uh, it's uniform in its way that it does its things uh, for all of these uh, networks. Yeah, but thank you, Vijay, for helping with that. So yeah, MAPS is our platform, our standard platform here that we're using for all of these protocol uh, emulation. And as Vijay was mentioning, it's um, uh, very simple to use. It's it's sort of uh, uh, it comes out of the box with some scripts, the protocol uh, state machine, basically for the different protocols, and it can be uh, very flexible in the way that you test with it. It can be a standard protocol state machine, or it can actually start doing some negative testing. So you can um, um, you you can test the protocol how how a node would react for negative testing. You can set it up to do uh, bulk calling, so you can simulate thousands of calls on, you know, using this Maps product. So very flexible. Uh, it's set up, and I'll briefly talk about this. It's it's set up in sort of three different um, sort of hierarchy within the actual Maps applications. There's scripts, there's messages, and there's profiles. With scripts, that's essentially the state machine. What happens when a certain message comes? with that protocol, what do you do, what do you respond with, and so forth. So it's the logic of the messages. The messages themselves, um, for instance, in, uh, you know, a setup message may be sent. Well, what is the contents of that setup message? That all is within our messages area of, of maps, and we can have a very, that, that can be very standard or that can be slightly off standard and you can adjust the message to a particular need that you may have. Uh, very customizable. The profiles are sort of the highest level here and the profiles are the specific information about maybe who you're calling. Um, for instance, the phone number that you may be calling it would be in a profile. Some of the custom information about that call setup would be in the profile. So I'm, I'm going to um, scan through these pretty quickly here, but with MAPS, we have a CAS protocol emulator. And as VJ was mentioning, some legacy uh, R1, MFCR2, Feature Group D, Wink Start protocols, all of that is supported within our CAS protocol emulator within MAPS. And um, 
uh, that can be. Uh, and that CAS stands for channel, yeah, as it's written here. <laughs> I know you guys can read channel associated signaling. So CAS is just a short uh, acronym for channel associated signaling. And normally in these protocols, uh, the signaling is very slow. It's a, a, you're familiar with it on a local loop. It's DTMF on these trunks. Uh, it's uh, MF signaling here in America. In Europe, it's uh, MFCR2 uh, dual tones. Um, and uh, these things can, th these are actually uh, what, what, uh, what the protocols were in the analog world. And they've just been translated into the digital world by just, you know, uh, going to ALA MU law. Uh, so uh, these things are still used in uh, enterprises as well as, uh, for example, air traffic control or uh, many legacy networks uh, that haven't yet transitioned to um, to packet or um, even uh, to, to uh, um, you know the, um, the the higher speed protocols like ISDN SS7. You can continue, Matt. Yep. Sure. So uh, just a screenshot of our CAS MFCR2 call generation here. This is a standard uh, screen that you would see within all of our MAPS protocol uh, emulators. So um, you're able to actually, on the, on the top pane here, look at this particular call session and start that, initiate it, and then you, you actually are able to see the ladder diagram of how the call is being set up. And if you click on one of the messages, you'll get a plain English decode of that message. So um, the true protocol is happening here. We're simulated. This is all um, in-band protocol, uh, CAS. So uh, you're seeing it uh, at that level. The, the screenshot is kind of, you're going to see it replicated here on a couple slides for the different protocols. but as we mentioned earlier, the, the MAPS um, architecture is the same for all different protocols, very similar screens, the way that they're laid out. So if you're, if well, you're in, let me yes. Index here, this MFCR2 is kind of a unique uh, protocol. Uh, if you uh, or if you're in from that old, old telephony world, uh, you will realize that R1 in America is essentially um, uh, it's a non-compelled um, protocol, meaning you send tones, you expect the receiver to decode them. If they didn't decode them, then you have to try again, essentially. But in MFCR2, uh, it's used mostly in Europe, and it was standardized by the ITU. The, the, the interesting thing about this is it's called compelled. So there's actually an acknowledgement for every tone. And uh, it's a very interesting sequence and requires a lot of digital signal processing capability within uh, within the protocol emulation itself. So we do implement that as well and I uh, just thought I'd just throw that in there. Yeah, no, that's perfect. I'm thank, thank you for filling in the gaps on the particulars here with the protocols. So um, I think we have a couple slides that I think in for, for time's sake oh, we want to get through pretty quickly here, but um, Again, with the maps, now we're talking about SS7 protocol emulator. So again, very similar in nature in the way that maps is set up. We're a protocol emulator. We can emulate many calls. Now the protocol is an SS7, which um, if you're familiar with SS7 a little bit, we're talking about now out of band signaling. So a, a signaling channel or a trunk may be devoted to just the signaling, the voice uh, conversations, the voice trunks may be a separate T1 or E1 or separate time slots. So it's out of band um, uh, signaling. I guess we would refer to that, BJ, as out of band signaling, um, dedicated signaling channel there. Yes, and it's usually in T1, it's uh, what normally time slot 2024 20, for ISDN, and sometimes it's that. It may be some different time slots for, for T1, but in, in a in E1, it's usually time slot 16 uh, that is carrying that. Yes, for, for ISDN, that, that is true. For I think for SS7, you know, it's flexible in how you set it up. So uh, you have to identify, you know, what, what channel that would be on and so forth. But um, just a network diagram here uh, of SS7. Uh, we're showing a, a little demo 
of maps, um, the SS7 protocol emulator within, you know, with maps, where it's making bunches of calls here. You can kind of see in the background it making a bunch of calls. And in the foreground here at the bottom right, you're actually getting to see sort of your call graph and how many calls are happening, uh, you know, in the time domain there. Calls per second, simultaneous calls that are active. It looks like we're generating over 1,500 calls right now. So this is just showing you a little uh, animation of, of how MAPS is operating. Yes. And that, so, so what I would I would say I uh, just add to what you just said in the, on the previous slide. Yeah. Um, uh, so Maps operates across all of those platforms that we talked about. So in this case, Matt is showing you the uh, our higher density uh, application of that that would be riding on perhaps a T3 E3 or a OC3. We can actually run protocol emulation on literally hundreds to thousands of channels. Um, and you could create the signaling as well as the voice traffic for all of those uh, those channels. It's great for loading uh, um, loading networks. Uh, for example, in the next generation technologies, you might use something like this to uh, to test gateways, which are converting from TDM to packet. Correct. Yeah, and, and in fact, um, that's correct. So you could have this SS7. Um, MAPS SS7 protocol emulator on the TDM side of the gateway. And, you know, we have other products on the IP side. We could have an emulator, uh, the SIP emulator on the on the far side of the gateway, and you can make the call from, from test equipment to test equipment and then do some testing that way. So, um, okay, I'd like to um, get moving here. Uh, we're a little behind, and I apologize for that. Um, the MAPS... Uh, Okay, so one other thing that we'd like I, to... I'll take this, this slide. Yeah, please. Maps do. FXOFXS, well, we went, we, went, we went to SS7, which was a much faster signaling technology, um, but FXOFXS is, you know, uh, your subscriber technology. That means the old POTS, uh, plain old telephone service, uh, the telephone that you have at home, or you may have these days, you may not, if you're, your mom probably has it, uh, that's the two-wire phone that uh, is used for uh, making placing phone calls. So those are that's traditionally called FXO and FXS. These are the two-wire loops. So we can. Uh, I think Matt showed you earlier on the T probe. We have the analog interfaces uh, FXO FXS. So our Maps product again is applicable for even local loop uh, emulation. Uh, both the central office side as well as the subscriber side. And this actually does come in handy. Uh, we have this in a higher density platform as well. We call that APS, where we can simulate these local loop, uh, either side of the local loops uh, in hundreds uh, to thousands of channels. Uh, that's useful in this uh, new, uh, new uh, the triple play technologies that carriers are offering to many subscribers. And carry on, Matt. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Um, so, Vijay, you can continue I mean, uh, on your theme here. This is the MAPS screenshot of that call generation uh, in the two-wire domain. Uh, you can see, uh, you know, the seizure happens. This is now the protocol happening between we're dialing the digits, the ring back tone is detected, and so forth. Now it's connected. So this is the uh, the two wire protocol that's happening on the line. Now, one thing that we'll mention on it with maps, um, everything we've mentioned so far is basically for call setup, making the call, um, SS7 with the CAS, and now with the two wire. After that call has been established, we uh, we have some of our traditional testing methods, which are sending and recording voice files. It can be done on all of these. Uh, all channels, all sessions that MAPS is established, tones, digits, even faxes, and so forth. So this all kind of can play into this uh, voice quality and, and quality of service sort of um, assessment of your network. So Matt, let me just interject here. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that this, this slide is showing you is TDM technology is, was, is and was great for traffic 
that is voice, tones, digits, facts, and modems. We didn't list modem here, but we also do modems. Um, so this is the traditional traffic that is being carried that, that TDM was meant for. Uh, the packet world, of course, introduced high-speed data and packets, and that's the value that, of proposition that it added, and, and also the fact that it can integrate all of these technologies together as well as video. But um, the fact that we can uh, emulate, uh, we can create voice traffic, tones, digits, facts. This requires that our processors be able to do digital signal processing. So we have to be able to uh, create tones, dial tones, uh, digits, uh, ring back, all of these different call progress tones that are um, applicable to the TDM world. And they're also many times applicable in the packet world when you're trying to go through gateways. Um, so our platform, we have a very powerful engine, uh, part of our um, uh, TDM platform is our DSP engine. Uh, there we can generate uh, a voice band traffic, which includes digits, fax, tones, and voice files um, within using the native processor. So we can actually create hundreds to thousands of channels of this voice traffic. So that is one of the uh, uh, things that is very uh, powerful, especially when you are trying to load uh, big systems or gateways or central offices. Um, Matt, you can continue. Okay. Yeah. Um, just one slide devoted to some of our load generation with maps. And um, the important thing to understand here is with, with all of the call generation that we have with maps and the multiple sessions and the multiple channels that we're generating these calls on, we can generate them in um, sort of a very defined load pattern. So you can see the patterns that we have here on the bottom left, uh, but that's kind of the main point here with this slide is we're able to, um, with this MAPS product and with all of these hardwares that we've talked about, we're able to generate uh, different patterns of loading on the network under test. So I think that's the main point with this, this, uh, this slide here. Um, everything we've shown so far is actually making the voice calls, making or making the calls, making the um, uh, sending and recording and so forth. There's plenty of statistics that are available within this product uh, where you can see what's going on. I think we were showing some graphs earlier, but there's some performance uh, related statistics, um, error, error screens calls are not getting connected, things of that nature. So we have a lot of statistics that are available within the product as well. And uh, Vijay, I'd like for you, if you could talk a little bit about this Datacom analyzer. I think you're, you're very familiar okay. with that. So, um, uh, okay, so when uh, before Packet took off, uh, we used to send data using serial interfaces. And those serial interfaces are uh, you know, these V35, X21, RS-232, remember that, RS-449. So these are all very uh, elaborate serial interfaces that had lots of control leads and acknowledgements, clear to send, request to send, that sort of thing. And generally they were used with modems uh, that did voice band communication over the, you know, public switch telephone network. Believe it or not, these types of interfaces still exist because the enterprises are reluctant to uh, 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 replace things that work. <laughs> so, uh, so they since these these systems are still out there, many times you have to convert from these interfaces to perhaps a, a packet interfaces or maintain these types of uh, these types of interfaces in a pseudo wire type of environment or um, or basic or maybe handle this type of uh, these types of interfaces across uh, next generation technologies. So our T probe in this particular case shows that we have this DCE DTE interfaces that handle uh, this these legacy serial data transmission technologies. The, the rates here were uh, now, of course, you, you think of these as very low rates, but uh, back then, about what, 30 years ago or so, uh, these are 
um, usually high bandwidth rates. These are several megabits here. RS-232, of course, was up, um, usually hundreds of bits per second to thousands of bits per second. RS-449 is much higher speed, so millions of bits per second. But these interfaces are still out there. Our datacom analyzer and emulator is able to handle these uh, these interfaces uh, because they still are out there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, to continue with that, I think. Uh, okay. So there's here's yeah. another slide. It's just just another depiction that we can do. Okay. So all our applications, uh, our voice band applications, our maps applications. Um, our emulation applications, they're all uh, geared to, there's a GUI application for user-friendly uh, point-and-click type of operation. There's also uh, for automation and for remote ability and for multi-user, we use this Windows client server um, um, a nomenclature to, to describe our capability to do progr programmatic uh, testing. So this is useful for automation if you're doing regression testing or, or testing um, devices on the uh, uh, on the production floor. So you can you can go through a lot of uh, sequential testing for uh, passing and failing products. So all of our applications, whether it's Datacom or it's ISDN or SS7 or packet protocols, the Maps platform provides us uh, through this. Um, and, and also this uh, Windows client server um, a capability to allow us to automate, provide multi-user, and also um, scripting. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, we touched on it a little bit, and, and I'll be brief with this as well, but um, voice quality testing software that GL has, it, uh, in a sense, a standalone software that's uh, running it. Yes. Yeah, can you... Yes, yeah, see if you can adjust your microphone. Um, 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 your voice quality is not very good. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, but uh, I think uh, uh, voice quality, of course, is a very useful uh, feature, and there are many standards associated with voice quality. Uh, you may remember that about maybe 10 years ago, there were uh, standards called PSQM, PESQ, um, these were new standards that ITU had promulgated that uh, were available. Then uh, we went to um, uh, the, the later, latest standard is called POLQA, P-O-L-Q-A, which is applicable for both packet environments and TDM environments. So this software is actually capable of doing all of these ITU standards uh, from, uh, from PAMS, that's a ITU P800, PSQM, PESQ, all the way to Polka. So it's, it's useful for across the board for all voice applications, whether they're narrow band, uh, like for example, 64 kilobit PCM, MULAW, ALAW, or they're wide band, like for example, AMR or, or the wide band codecs that are used in LTE technology. So this software is able to do voice quality across the board. Um, Polka is uh, the latest algorithm and it's applicable for the full band voice uh, traditional voice had a frequency range from 300 to 3400 this is the bandwidth that uh, generally PSTN networks handled uh, and the codec that was used there was a law or mu law and that is depicted here as narrow band the actual sampling was uh, up to 8,000 samples per second, being able to transmit 4,000 hertz of bandwidth. But because of the fact that the low and high bands are always going to get filtered by by a communication facilities, you, the usable bandwidth was 300 to 3,400. So we call that narrow band. The voice quality algorithm is able to handle this. Uh, a wider band is from 50 to about 7,000 hertz, and many codecs. Uh, use that uh, that bandwidth for, for example, I think uh, maybe a, one of the AMR codecs is perhaps that that wide. Um, and of course, for the future, super wide band and full wide band uh, is also available in the Polka algorithm, although it is not that widely 
used as of now. Um, but the algorithm itself, the voice quality algorithm uh, that is uh, embedded into our different platforms whenever voice applications are, um, are used, um, this Polka algorithm is able to assess voice quality end to end, uh, whether it's from a mobile phone, so we can interface directly to a mobile phone, uh, or it's a handset, or we generate voice files in through a file mechanism, as Matt had mentioned earlier, uh, through that file record, you know, file transmit record capability. So we can do all of those different ways of transmitting voice files, reference voice files, and capture the degraded voice file at the other end and make measurements end to end. And we can do that simultaneously on hundreds of channels, even thousands of channels, as long as the horsepower is available. Yeah, so, okay, now we're going to transition. All of the applications we've talked about so far have been intrusive applications, so protocol emulation, bit error rate testing, and so sending and recording voice files. Now we're talking about, again, on the, on, on the hardwares that we had shown earlier in the presentation, we have non-intrusive applications. And one of the main non-intrusive applications that GL offers is something called protocol analysis. So in the TDM world, we have a variety of protocols that can that are supported with these with these hardwares. ISDN, I think we've mentioned some of these. ISDN, HDLC, SS7, Frame Relay, Trow, CDMA, so forth. And you can see here what we have. In the E1 world, we have uh, different ones, including GR303, SS1. So some legacy things. Um, and uh, we have this protocol analysis capability for for these protocols. Uh, normally, our protocol analysis would be will operate in a non-intrusive manner, and it would be uh, operating across many many channels simultaneously. The uh, pro uh, the protocol analysis, of course, can be used for analyzing a single call and or analyzing the protocol in its nitty-gritty detail. But also, protocol analysis is useful for collecting calls. In a, at a gross level. So let's assume you had thousands of calls that, that are running uh, simultaneously across an interface like an OC3 or STEM1 interface where you were running ISDN or SS7. There we could be analyzing the protocol analysis can operate individually as well as simultaneously on all of those channels and collecting uh, the individual messages uh, sorting them out into calls, what we call call records, call data records, and uh, uh, you know condensing that, perhaps recording the voice if that's what you wanted and it's, if it's uh, allowed, uh, and then transmitting that information, this consolidated information, which has all of the details that you see in this table here, uh, which is quite an extensive amount of information that can be used for a variety of, of, of things, including just simple billing would be one thing, diagnostics would be another, fraud would be something else. There's so many different applications for protocol analysis. The, uh, but anyway, we can take all of this information, consolidate it, and put it into a database. Matt? Um, so with the protocol analysis, as VJ mentioned, I think it's important to bring up the applications, and he, and he said it, uh, that from a gross level, you can use the protocol analysis to do things as simple as count calls, or you can uh, yeah, rec check on billing type situation, and then as low as looking at the true hex dump of a particular message of the protocol. So truly trying to figure out what is going on with the protocol and understanding what's going on between the exchange of protocol messages. So the protocol analysis is, is, a, is a good platform for doing all of the above what we just mentioned, um, from, from counting calls to doing a very detailed dive into the protocol. It is organized in, in just from screen purposes here and GUI purposes, uh, like so. All, all frames are, are, are being shown at the top pane here. It's sort of, we call that the summary view. 
if you are selecting one of these frames, you'll get a plain English decode of that. So that's the protocol decode of that particular message with the hex dump. And then we have a statistical and uh, call trace or call detailed record view. So this is organizing all of the calls uh, into, this is organizing all of the messages and the frames into uh, calls. So this is one particular call, sorry, uh, at the top here, this first line, it may have uh, six or eight uh, actual messages associated with it, but we're organizing it into one call from this particular guy to this guy. So it gives you some statistics. So it's kind of a gross view of what's going on at a call by call basis. Okay. Okay. So yeah, Matt, let me uh, um, yep. maybe take the next slide. The ISDN, same thing as what Matt was saying. Uh, is applicable for ISDN. Uh, you can get down to the individual messages that comprise a particular call or the progress of a call. As you know, in ISDN, there are these messages called alerting and call proceeding and uh, termination of, of the call. And the, this is all great for billing and for actually the progress of the call or establishing the call. And these messages are, are in these, uh, in these types of protocols, ISDN SS7, they're very rapid. They're meant to establish calls uh, at a very fast pace or with call setup times that are very short. So, um, and you want to be able to see those individual messages so that you can perhaps diagnose any problems that might exist in the signaling. Um, so uh, that's what this is for. But in a broader sense, you want to be able to uh, consolidate these calls at a higher layer and see whether or not these calls are uh, the volume of calls is is appropriate or is there is is your system handling these calls we have some applications where we're using these uh, at call centers at transit call centers where there are literally uh, tens of thousands of calls per hour or yeah, or even more per day and these analyzers are able to process all of those calls, categorize them, and Matt is going to show you some of those slides here shortly. Um, the, so the, but the fundamental unit is the, is the analyzer. And then the uh, consolidation of it uh, th through all these messages uh, and, and the making sense of it all at a central layer is uh, what's also of great value. So there's a broad application for protocol analysis. In fact, it's one of the most fundamental applications in telecom networks that allow you to manage telecom networks, whether they are analog networks, TDM networks, or uh, now the higher rate packet networks, whether they're data sessions, fax calls, or voice calls. Protocol analysis is a fundamental requirement to diagnose uh, consolidate, gather statistics, uh, et cetera. So, and continue if you can. Yeah, um, yeah, may, may need a little help here. I think my mic is having some real problems. So, the me, yeah, let me just continue. So, the ISDN, these are the, the TDM protocols that are really very um, uh, popular in the TDM world. ISDN, of course, at the uh, PBX level, uh, the ISDN is converted to SS7 normally in the TDM uh, network with, uh, you know, STPs and, and so on, and databases behind the STPs called SCPs. Uh, CAS is an older legacy technology that uses in-band voice, uh, voice band tones for, uh, for signaling. It's a much slower signaling. But we have, we have these protocol analyzers across all of these uh, domains. And of course, uh, fundamental to our protocol analysis is this ladder diagram that shows the progress of calls, whether it's, it's high speed calls like SS7 or very low speed cast calls, which are sending digits one by one and a call setup time could be in what, tens of seconds. So this is a, uh, our protocol analysis is collecting this information in something called PDA. We use this term PDA um, uh, uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a term for looking at protocol messages 
at a consolidated call layer uh, and w associated with this, uh, with this um, uh, ladder diagram. And, um, and this, all this of PDA, this PDA also, I, I believe, has the ability, correct me if I'm wrong, you can actually listen to the voice of each call if you want to. Um, you can you, you can trigger on different events that are happening to trigger recordings if if problems are happening or phone call phone phone numbers show up uh, things like that I believe are capable uh, in this PDA as well. Yes, that's correct. Um, yeah. So uh, all of those types of things are possible. So in yes, at the very low layer, if you are having problems with uh, placing calls or you are having problems with uh, getting the signal, the setup of the call is having a problem, uh, well then you might be able to diagnose these types of problems by triggering on certain events uh, or, or you could um, look for that intermittent problem and uh, be just looking for that and, uh, and, and triggering off of that and then capturing that event. Um, so those are all the possibilities that are there. Okay. Perhaps you can go to the next slide. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we've hit on the features of PDA. I think that's probably okay. I'll, I'm going to continue. Um, yeah. You may want to explain a little bit about this, VJ, with the, the call capture and analysis. Okay. So yeah. we we have this this suite of um, uh, uh, of applications that allow you to do voice analysis, voice band analysis, that means digits and tones, capture calls trigger off of the protocol and uh, provide all of this consolidated information and store it and then later retrieve it based on what the customer complaint is. So this is we call uh, this is a little bit of a, a, a you know acronym <laughs> intense uh, application CCA VBA CDR monitoring applications. Well what this means is call capture and analysis that means we can capture voice calls um, based on the protocol, voice band analysis, that means we can analyze the content of the voice call, because many times calls may, uh, may be set up, but actually the path is not valid, or digits or um, uh, tones are not being uh, conveyed properly. So voice band analysis is crucial there. Uh, once the call is completed, or even if it's partially not completed, the CDR call data record is a useful summary of the call. Uh, and finally, the actual voice is recorded, and you can view that in any type of uh, audio program like uh, uh, I think Cool Edit, Adobe Audition, or Gold Wave. Or there are many audio programs. Audacity is a, is a recent one. Um, so all of these types of programs. So this is uh, one type of application that we have that, consol that has a, uh, consolidates and provides complete analysis of, um, of uh, voice calls, which includes the signaling, the protocol, the actual speech, uh, and the analysis of the actual voice band. VBA is also useful for fax analysis, for example. Uh, it's not necessarily voice, but it is a, uh, the fax signal is, um, uh, is can be analyzed. The actual fax image can be captured, can be printed out, and so on. So it has applications in multiple areas. Yeah, DJ. Um, okay. So here, NetSurveyor Web. We mentioned that this. Uh, the, so the fundamentally, our protocol analyzers are operating perhaps at the location points where those protocols are occurring. And that could be in the PSDN domain, that's the public switch telephone network, or it could be the 3G, 4G wireless domain, where you have wireless calls with varying codecs and signaling, uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, all of these, and now 5G um, are all there. Uh, so our probes can be operating at all of these different network technologies. And finally, of course, IP, which is the, now becoming the dominant technology for carrying both voice and data. Um, our probes, our protocol analyzers that Matt was talking about uh, at the fundamental layer are located at these diverse locations. They're collecting that protocol information and feeding it to a listener. 
which is collecting this that could be collecting the actual voice information as well as the all of the detailed protocol exchanges and that is being um, uh, stored in the Oracle data in an Oracle database or a MySQL database or we have various databases that uh, uh, actually store this for very long periods of time for both retrieval and uh, later analysis uh, or for other purposes so that uh, you can imagine. Um, so this is what we call our net surveyor web. It's applicable for IP, TDM, and wireless domains. It's a very powerful application that is, uh, can be used for all sorts of purposes like traffic engineering, fraud detection, uh, 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 capacity evaluation, and so on. Um, and the, we, we've got this deployed at so many different locations. Uh, we have it deployed for airlines, uh, analyzing VoIP calls and call records uh, at call centers, at uh, transit centers where um, you have a high volume of calls. So this, this ties together all our protocol analyzers. Uh, this is the really the most, one of the most valuable applications that we produce because it, at a very high layer, it provides information about what is going on at the very low layer and whether or not it is relevant or not. So many times networks operate correctly and that's great. And therefore you wanna just hear about it uh, maybe once a day or once a week saying that by email or by some message that says everything is going great. Uh, but if there are problems, you want alert messages. If there are uh, capacity issues or transient problems, then you want to be alerted immediately. This Net Surveyor Web Network Surveillance System allows that type of capability because it is collecting information from the very rudimentary uh, line signaling level or even alarm level at the uh, T T1E1 layer, all the way up to uh, sessions, large volumes of calls, and whether capacity is is being uh, uh, met or overloaded or whatever, or even whether calls are being handled correctly. So this is the yeah. this is our great application. Very good. Um, yes, for we'll, we'll hit on a couple quick screens here uh, for that. Um, Uh, Matt, were you, were you talking about this? The Net Surveyor Web um, is our application. Uh, this is our browser base. I think in the prior slide you saw an individual uh, in front of a monitor, and uh, he was basically accessing the browser. Um, uh, through a browser, he was accessing our database. That, that could be anywhere in the world. You could be in China accessing the database in America or vice versa or anywhere in the world actually. So the browser-based access gives you remoting capability, remote analysis capability. You access that through a simple browser, Chrome, uh, Microsoft, uh, uh, Edge or uh, any of those types of browsers and uh, you get all of the information that we talked about earlier but in a consolidated fashion. Here you see call by call um, information um, for each and every call. And now you can actually click on one of these call flows and get the detailed view of it. We may have, yeah, there it is right here. Uh, so if you clicked on that call flow, you would actually get this information. Now remember that this is available at the browser location. Whereas earlier we showed you this uh, same information at the probe level where we showed you that ladder diagram uh, and uh, where it was analyzing either ISDN calls or SS7 calls. But here we're at the, um, at, at the uh, brow well, through a browser, uh, interrogating an Oracle database, interrogating a call that has already happened, and uh, we're able to assess that call remotely because all of that information has been stored in the Oracle. It's near real time. so you pretty much have it as soon as it's completed. Um, now, one of the values of 
all of this database thing. And this is really where the real value is associated with protocol analysis. And that is the ability to take this consolidated information across uh, uh, the nitty gritty to a very high layer uh, uh, and provide key performance indicators. Uh, I think this is a term that is used in the industry. It's used for things like how fast are calls being set up, uh, how many calls, uh, how are they, how many failed calls, how many successful calls, um, what is the call duration, um, how many, um, you know, different types of statistics associated with the, each protocol. It gives you detailed information about um, what is going on within your network. It can be easily done if you uh, deploy these probes at strategic locations and collect this information centrally. Okay, um, we're very proud about we were very proud of our our net surveyor web because it is actually providing great value to real customers uh, in the real world today, and we have this deployed at so many different places. We also provide a service where after installing this this um, capability at the uh, customer location. Uh, since it is of such great value, we want to make sure that it is up and running constantly 24-7. So we do provide at a very low cost a monitoring service that allows you to make sure that the system is running cleanly. And we can set up set it up so that these types of reports that you see it in front of you can be emailed to you at midnight, for example. This is this particular report if you look at it carefully here this is a looks like a uh, uh an hour by hour report from midnight to uh midnight uh for 24 hours it's giving you the call volume and this is probably from a real system uh it shows you that there was very low volume during the early morning hours and it uh, started uh, you know much higher density it also shows you the calls on a trunk by trunk basis uh, in some sort of color coded fashion. So th this is actually very valuable for one of our customers. I think this is one of our transit customers that uh, you, and you can see here that there are thousands of calls. This meant is, uh, this is 1,300 calls. So you must be doing this on a heavily loaded trunk or um, many, many trunks actually. Um, so this is, very useful. This is a report that's generated daily uh, at I think around uh, one o'clock or so and sent to all of the customers. Um, okay, so the next slide. Um, uh, all right, very good. Uh, Sanjeev, do you want to take over? Were there any questions? Uh, no, Vijay, we are already running out of time and uh, we'll answer all the questions uh, offline. Okay, all right. Right now, we don't have any questions. Okay, all right, great. Um, well, I want to say on behalf of Matt, I think Matt's mic, um, Matt, is your mic still working or not? <laughs> okay, it's not. Um, so on behalf of Matt, Matt did a wonderful job. And we, it, uh, the recording of this webinar will be on our website. Um, uh, we hope you've enjoyed this webinar about our TDM platforms. Uh, just in a quick summary, it, it, it runs the gamut from individual lines to um, uh, very uh, large capacity uh, OC3, OC12, STEM1 platforms, and it can handle a variety of protocols. It's all tied together through our protocol analyzers and emulators uh, and our net surveyor web to provide a comprehensive solution for legacy TDM networks. So uh, we hope uh, uh, you will uh, ask us more questions and perhaps uh, if you're interested, give us a call and we'll, uh, we'll be happy to tell you more about our products in this domain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vijay.